We are for the church and for the kingdom. This vision drives everything we do. There are many noble causes and institutions in this world, and we care about the future of seminaries, academies, governments, social causes, and parachurch ministries, but they are not fundamentally why we exist. We exist for the future of the church and the advancement of God's kingdom. With God's help, our students today will be the pastors, ministers, and missionaries of the global church tomorrow. We teach the Bible in the classroom so that generations of churches will be sturdy outposts of Christ's kingdom. This is how we serve the church, and this is how we bless every other good and noble endeavor until God's glory covers the earth like the waters cover the sea. Will you join us? Join me at Hebrews 4. The all-employee meeting. What could be more exciting? You get that email? Rivaled only by the postcard that you get in the mail regularly that your car registration is due. And you must personally show up at the DMV. All documentation, real ID, note from your mother. The all employee meeting. Wish you could have been there just over a month ago. Doesn't matter what organization you're a part of, you get that notification and you must attend. There could be some vital nugget of information about your health insurance, about something that really matters to your bottom line, so you must attend. And we have all employee meetings here at the seminary, the beginning of the year, generally in August and just over a month ago, but I wish you could have been there because the all employee meetings at MBTS are a bit different. Certainly we have the necessary components of information about perhaps health insurance or retirement, introduction of new employees. But Dr. Allen provides a spiritual framework for these meetings. After all, we are a seminary, Bible college. So there's a devotional, there's often some singing, and we regularly close with prayer, a season of prayer, in fact, not just someone praying, but several people leading in prayer with preparation and specific focus. Normally, it's the deans who pray for the various areas that they oversee. And this year, Dr. Beerig praying, Dr. Smith, Dr. Madsen, I prayed. I wish, I wish you could have been there. I think you would have been highly encouraged. You would have had to endure the normal information. But to hear the prayers of other leaders was a great encouragement to me and I think it would have been to you. We were praying for you. At the start of the semester, health insurance matters, benefits matter, all the structures, be on time, answer email, all the rest. But fundamentally, we were praying for you. And we were praying that God would give you confidence in ministry. Nearly every one of those prayers, uncoordinated, but a stream ran right through us, one to the other. God, help these students to believe you and be robust in their ministry leadership. What would prompt us to pray that way? Well, it's the simple biblical reality of what God has done for us in the gospel. 
We have every reason to be confident. And we need to pray that way for you because there are so many factors coming against you. Some of those are external, some are internal in our age that threaten your confidence. And confidence is a tricky concept in our culture, isn't it? I want to define confidence today, and I want to define it as we set out. Confidence is not bullying brashness. It's a settled conviction because of what God has done and what he has called us to. It's not bullying. It's not brashness. It's not self-centered or self-generated. It's resultative. It's reflective. It's a settled conviction because of what God has done. I want this morning to preach for you a topical doctrinal exposition tracing the theme of Jesus' high priestly ascension in the book of Hebrews with the goal of simply stating the text as it is and following this theme. And what we will gather along the way is, in fact, confidence because of Jesus' help to us. I want to argue today that Jesus' high priestly ascension as presented in Hebrews is a presentation of him helping us. The eternal son completing his mission now in heaven, helping you and me. I want to look at five specific passages in Hebrews. We'll begin in Hebrews 4. We'll stop at Hebrews 7. Next, we'll look at chapter 10 briefly, chapter 12 briefly. We'll end with the benediction in chapter 13. And here we have a basis. Here is why we should be confident in leading ministry whether it's to the mission field, whether it's in the local church, why we should be confident. And then we'll conclude with five avenues for expressing that confidence. Five passages to talk about why. Five avenues in conclusion to think about how. But confidence in in ministry, we should recognize at the outset, it's not like confidence in ministry sort of comes out of the blue in Hebrews. Just survey briefly the Old Testament for a moment. In the great transition from Moses to Joshua, what does the Lord tell Joshua in Joshua chapter 1? Be strong and courageous. I am with you. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. Be careful to do all that is written in it. Consider another major transition in Israel's history. Haggai chapter 2. What does Haggai tell the, the leaders? Be strong. Despite the opposition, despite the disappointment of this temple, be strong and courageous. Be confident. God is near. God is with you. Repeatedly, we see this collocation of ideas. God is telling his leaders to lead with confidence, and he's reinforcing that with his personal presence. And I want to argue today that God's presence is no more near to us than Jesus' ascension. That's the irony. His distance from us actually brings God's help near to us. That's what the ascension does. Join me then, Hebrews chapter 4. I want to look with you at verses 14 to 16. The first of five passages we'll look at in Hebrews. And here we see the help Jesus provides. And the confidence we should have. Hebrews 4, 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to the confession. 
we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tested in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us at the proper time. In the structure of Hebrews, this paragraph, many commentators note, is a synthesis of themes from chapter 1 and verse 1 to this point. We'll look in a few moments at chapter 2. 10, beginning in verse 19. These two paragraphs, however you structure Hebrews, these are recognized as, because of their repeated ideas, similar grammatical forms, as structurally significant in the eyes of the author. And he is setting these out for us sort of as pillars in all of what's said. I I think there is the case that 4, 14 to 16 synthesizes 1, 1 through 4, 13, and chapters 5 through 10, 19, or 10, 18, are synthesized in 10, 19 and following. There's a synthesis going on here. It's noted in one word in 4, 14 that begins, therefore, the therefore, I think, reaches back to chapter 1 and verse 1. God, in various ways, time past, spoke to the fathers, the prophets, in these last days is spoken to us by his son. Who is that son? He's been presented as a priest. Jesus, the son of God. The sympathetic helper. And notice verse 16, a second therefore. Therefore, let us approach And that approach language implies distance. To approach something implies logically that it's not proximal. One has to go to it. And this is the great irony of God's nearness. We approach, and it's, though Jesus is in heaven, the the distance is unquantifiable. He's right there. (laughs) So far away, it can't be measured, and yet he's He's right there. Grace, mercy, access. It's as if he's sitting right beside you. The eternal son. All of his fullness there, right beside you. To find grace and help. So be confident. We all need help. The degree to which we get help depends on the character of the helper. And what's the character of this helper? He's without sin, and yet he's gracious and merciful. Peter Ortz says the idea this way in his book, Exalted Above the Heavens. In Hebrews... The idea is that Jesus is continuing to sustain and help believers. Jesus sustains believers in time of temptation so that they will persevere in their faith. In your moment of need, in my moment of need, that is when we can count on Jesus. Again, the kind of help that we receive depends on the character of the helper. It's one thing to have a helper who's near. It's a whole other issue if that near helper is ready to actually help us or not. And he is at the time of our need. You have every reason to be confident. And we're just getting started. Join me at the last paragraph of Hebrews 7. (sighs) 
This is number 401 on the list of reasons students should learn Greek. Number 402 is Hebrews 13 that we'll get to in a moment. Verse 26. This is the kind of high priest we need. Holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. He doesn't need to offer sacrifices every day as high priests do, first for their own sins and then for the sins of the people. He did this once for all when he offered himself. The law appoints as high priests men who are weak, but the promise of the oath, which came after the law, appoints a son who has been perfected forever. Notice again the character of this helper. He's different from us. Categorically different. But he's also similar to us. This is the kind of high priest we need. He's holy, he's innocent, he's undefiled. This high priest, he isn't weak. He's a son perfected forever, and he has passed through the heavens, verse 26, and he is there for us. The author of Hebrews is mounting this argument about Jesus as helper. We're looking at five passages. This is not exhaustive of the doctrine of Jesus' exaltation and ascension in the New Testament. It's not exhaustive of Hebrews, but we're gathering up these five passages as a basis for confidence and to stimulate us to be confident, not brash, not self-centered, but a settled conviction about what God has done, who the Son is, and what this means for humanity. It's interesting here that the presentation in verses 26 through 28 distinguish Jesus from other priests. Notice verse 27, they did their work day after day for their own sins, then for the sins of the people. And the cumulative totality of Jesus' high priestly self-sacrifice here in this section in Hebrews 7 through 9 especially is an argument for completion and fulfillment. It's done once because it's effective. The author of Hebrews argues that the repetitive nature of the Old Covenant in one sense showed that it was only temporarily and iteratively effective. It wasn't final. And here at the end of Hebrews 7, after the contrast with Melchizedek, the author wants us to know this is final. And if it's final, you can count on it. That's the point. The degree of his completion and finality is the degree to which you should be confident in ministry. F.F. F. Bruce states the idea this way, Christians have as their high priest one who does not remain in the realm of ideas, but is the incarnate logos, one who preserved his purity while treading the common ways of this world and sharing our human lot. Although he came to earth in the likeness of sinful flesh, lived among sinners, received sinners, ate with sinners, was known as a friend of sinners, yet he is set apart from sinners and is now exalted above all the heavens to share the throne of God. And what did the author say in chapter 4? That's the throne of grace. That's the, the throne of enablement. 
That's the throne of the helper. Chapter 10. Hebrews 10, 19. I mentioned earlier, two paragraphs at least structure Hebrews 1, chapter 4, last paragraph 14 to 16 here, 10, 19 and following, several ideas repeated. Again, it's as if 1, 1 to 4, 13 is a flight that lands in Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. The author takes off again all of the passengers in tow with this great Christological presentation all the way from 5.1 through here at about 10.18, the contrast of Melchizedek, the fulfillment of the new covenant. Jeremiah 31, he lands that plane, and here we are at 10.19 with another therefore. Brothers, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus by the new and living way that he has inaugurated for us through the curtain that is his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Every reason to be confident. This high priest his own flesh, a new status given to us, access there, and he is presented not just in all of his majesty, but in gory details. His flesh, freshly slaughtered, bloody, that's our access This is a God who wants to help his people. Verse 22, let us draw near. We're changed. We have a true heart. The, the true heart is not just the, the new kind of righteousness status we enjoy. It's a settled conviction as well here. It's, it's not just a receptive idea. It's an active. I'm drawing near with a true heart because I realize, God, what you have done, what you have called me to, the status of the world, and because of that, I'm coming to you because I need help. I truly recognize what you have done. I recognize my weakness. I recognize what you've called me to. I'm coming with a true heart. That trueness is an indicative state. It's also an active characteristic because I need you, God. And as I'm coming, verse 22, I am fully assured I'm fully aware of my need and I'm fully aware that you know it and you are a helper. I'm confident, God, in what you've said, what you've called me to, and I'm confident that in my coming now, you're going to help. I am so confident, God, I'm not going to look elsewhere. It's a settled conviction. If you don't show up in this way now that I see, I'm not going to doubt you. I'm just going to wait. I'm not going elsewhere. It's Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 8. Ahaz, idolatry all around. And, and what does Isaiah say? <laughs> Here I 
am and the children you have given me, which the author of Hebrews quotes in chapter two, putting it on the lips of Jesus. Here I am and the children you gave me. That's on Jesus' lips, figuratively speaking, in the incarnation. You, his children, you the ones he's going to help. Oh, the author of Hebrews would be delighted at your confidence. Not brash bullying, but a settled conviction that you have stated, you have called, and this is it. Chapter 12. The author of Hebrews is famous for contrasts sometimes with various figures like Moses and Jesus, various peoples, Israel and the author, the author's audience, but sometimes even geographically, mountains. Hebrews 12. You've not come to what could be touched, verse 18, a blazing fire, darkness, gloom, storm, referring back to Mount Sinai and the Exodus, rather. <clears throat> Verse 22, you have come to Mount Zion. Look what you've come to. You've not come to the place where it was told, stay away, even if an animal comes near, it must be stoned. Moses didn't even want to come near. I'm terrified and trembling. Instead, verse 22, you've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels in festive gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn whose names have been written in heaven, to God who is the judge of all, to the spirits of righteous people made perfect. Look at this, how it concludes, verse 24. We're waiting for it. To Jesus. That's who you've come to. This ascended priestly mediator of the new covenant and to sprinkled blood, which says better things than the blood of Abel. You have come. We began in chapter 14 or chapter 4 verses 14 to 16 and began to notice spatial imagery and dualism that dominates the author's uh, perspective in, in portraying the great irony that though there is such distance between heaven and earth and Jesus' ascension, the irony is that the height to which he has ascended is actually the nearness to which he is accessible to help you. Because he is there, you have proximal help. You and other believers with you. This is the city of the living God, verse 22. The assembly of the firstborn whose names, verse 23, not just your name. How magnificent is Jesus, the high priest ascended. At, he helps all of his people and always has. Let the plurality here embolden us all to come. So powerful is our God. He can help all of us. It's one idea to state that he could help me and give me confidence in my situation. So powerful is Jesus, the great ascended high priest. He can help all of us. Let that embolden you to come all the time, to come with all that you need from God and to settle your conviction that there's no need to go elsewhere because he is mighty. We'll never run out of resources. I mentioned that all-employee meeting and the confidence and prayer. I want to just state it clearly, just, just so you're fully aware. When Dr. Dusing says your name at graduation, Dr. Allen hands you a diploma. If you're getting a doctoral degree and Dr. Madsen or Dr. Park or Dr. Senna hood you, mark it well. You walk across this stage. It is because we believe in you. 
You're not walking across the stage and we don't ever uh, approve someone for graduation saying, well, hope it works out. What's, what's the odds on this? It's because we believe what God has said and we believe that you have received it. We believe that you've heeded the training and we are confident in our God and what he is gonna do for you. Being around MBTS for a bit, uh, two decades has given me a privilege to see so, so many blessed events and experiences. I, I don't know if I could articulate in terms of campus transformation one more so than the Mark T. Coppinger Library. Do you remember what it was like before? Shouldn't there be a cable TV documentary about what happened? I think there should be. It is the eighth wonder of the world. There used to be, when you walked into the library, on the left there was a large map. And I remember over two decades ago now, standing in front of that map with another student here, and a student who was a part of my church, and we prayed together, and he sensed a call to international missions and to specifically Bible translation, and I remember the day when he pointed and told me, that's where we're going, and that's the people group we're going to. He was a part of my church, and so we took them on to support them and encourage them and pray for them over the years. And the thrill of, of, of my life, summer of 2022, going to that people group with him to dedicate a New Testament that he translated in those 20 years. Between the time when we stood by that map and when we stood in that congregation of people and I'm preaching from this New Testament, and it's the first sermon ever delivered from it. And he's translating it. Do you know how hard it is to be a Bible translator? I went with him 22 to dedicate this and spoke at this event for a missions organization there. Went back this last summer in 2023 to do the same and do some text criticism training for translators. And every time I was talking with someone, I was thinking, this may be the smartest person I ever meet. To be a Bible translator, you have to be a biblical scholar, a linguist. Those aren't always the same, by the way. They're two different, they're related disciplines, but different. You have to be an expert in both. You have to, to have business savvy because you hire locals to help you test what you put into their language to make sure it's accurate. And business practices around the world are different in various places. You have to have cross-cultural competency. It's so hard. There are all kinds of international calls that are so hard. And my goal today is to settle conviction in your heart, you who are called, that every need you have, you can take to Jesus Christ, the mediator of the new covenant, ascend it on high, and he hears and he helps. That is the fuel that will empower you for the long haul. That's how you start a translation and 20 years of slog, you get it done. And you can. Jesus, the high priest of the new covenant, the helper. Last week, I was on a call Sunday afternoon, an alumni from MBTS graduate just a couple years ago, a different friend gave me as a reference for a, a new church, and so I'm on the call with the search committee, not the alumni, just the search committee, and he began to describe the church, and when, when I'm on these kinds of calls and so forth, I'm not sure what, what should I expect, how's this, you know, what's the situation, and if you're called to a, a new church, obviously you want to do as much research as you can, and there's a spectrum of challenges Sometimes the irony is we think, well, I don't want to go to a church that's had a lot of troubles. I don't want to go to a church that's got all these problems because what am I going to do with it? Well, 
take courage. If you just show up and be nice, you can probably win the day if it's really bad. Don't shy from that. Do the math, do the investigation. But if you show up, teach the Bible, you're nice, you can, you can probably be pretty appreciated. I want to mark it for you now. Some of the most challenging experiences if you're going to follow someone who's done well. And so I asked about the situation of this church in there. They said, well, we had a pastor for about 13 years and one for about 12. Everybody's happy. Things are good. And I just began to think, oh, my, what is this guy getting himself into? What are you going to do when you enter that kind of a situation where the previous pastor was appreciated and liked? And now they have to adjust to you. You're going to go to God and you're going to get help. You're going to get new covenant help to endure and to be strong. Final passage, chapter 13, the benediction. Here's why you should be confident. You walk across that stage on graduation day. Here's what I'm thinking. Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, with the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip you with all that is good to do his will, working in us what is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Do you see the theological synthesis here? The degree to which God is jealous for his glory is the degree to which he helps you. That's just normal, basic new covenant theology. That's nothing special. That's run-of-the-mill, plain Jane vanilla. This is your God. The degree to which he is jealous for glory is the degree to which he works through you. These five passages are why we should be confident. Well, let's think about how for just a few moments here. Five avenues, if you will, for expressing this confidence. And these are right from Hebrews. When you preach a topical doctrinal message, obviously you're, you're going to be a bit more limited in what you can get done, but it should be the case that people walk away with a broader sense of the whole of that book or the context in which you're dealing. So these five avenues are right from Hebrews. Five avenues where we express our confidence in the ascended Christ in our ministries. Number one, we express it in reverence for the word. Back in chapter 12, verse 25, see that you do not reject the one who speaks. For if they did not escape when they rejected him who mourned on earth, even less will we when we turn away from him who warns us from heaven. This is one of many places, even reaching back to chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. We should heed God's word. That is an avenue for expressing our confidence in God. If we are confident in Jesus, our high priest, heed his word. This is a way we express it. And as we lead we lead in such a way that the whole congregation recognizes that the movement we are leading depends entirely upon the unfolding word of God. Everything depends on the next chapter and the next verse. Just, we're all hanging on it. That's how we demonstrate confidence in the resurrected Jesus and his ascension and his empowerment. 
We hold fast to this confession of our faith. Chapter 10, again, verse 23, let us hold on to the confession, just as we looked at in chapter 4. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering. He who promised is faithful. This is where we remain. I'm going to stay. I'm going to be satisfied right here. Number two, fervent and expectant pursuit of God in prayer. First avenue for expressing our confidence is heeding the word. Second is seeking God in prayer and expecting him to answer a fervent pursuit of God in prayer with all kinds of requests. Lord, help. Help me with this. Help me with this. Confident he hears. Confident he is so powerful. He helps all of us. Fervent and expectant pursuit of God in prayer. Number four, or excuse me, number three, uh, a deep concern for brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. Our love and commitment to the fellowship that we are in and that we are leading is an avenue where we express our hope in God and the nearness that we enjoy in Jesus' ascension. Iterative throughout Hebrews, these pockets of concern for other believers. Chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Watch out, brothers, so there won't be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. Encourage each other, Daily, while it's called today, so that none of you is swayed by the deceitfulness of sin. In chapter 12, that none of you is hardened by the difficult circumstances of life. You have brothers and sisters around you, and you demonstrate your belief in Jesus' supremacy as you love them. You're concerned about them. I don't want you to be encouraged. Let's keep pressing on together. Let's keep going. A part of this is sharing leads us to number four in our avenues. Contentment and confidence with resources, even sharing them. Number four, contentment and confidence with resources, even sharing them. In chapter 10, the author is writing about the suffering that the believers have had to endure the confiscation of their property. Well, if their property is confiscated, it might mean that you need to share some of yours. That's an avenue where we, we express our confidence. Lord, I know you're going to take care of me. Chapter 13. Your life should be free from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Therefore, we may boldly say, Hebrews 13, 6, The Lord is my helper, quoting from Psalm 118. The Lord is my helper. The Lord is my helper. The Lord is my helper. Let that echo in your mind like a modern praise song. When you see people in your church in need, the Lord is my helper. How can I help? When you see folks in need, that is a place to recognize. The Lord is my helper. And he is generous. Number five the last avenue to consider. It's endurance of opposition for Christ. Simply endurance. Endurance, perhaps, in the most costly way of our own lives. And this is the culmination of Hebrews' argument that believers would be willing to lay down their lives. They have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. They might have to. And it's at that point they can be confident. I close with Athanasius on the incarnation. He, he's right here in this section in on the incarnation. He has just written about the publicness of Jesus' death. It's public. And Athanasius is doing apologetics here in a sense of it's verifiable. Jesus didn't go die in a corner somewhere for the forgiveness of our sins. It was open, public. He came on Rome's terms. He let them set the terms and he came on their terms. He did this so it's public and verifiable, so his resurrection would be verifiable. All public. And he's just so close to Hebrews 13. Let us go to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Public. Athanasius says this, With death being despised and trampled down since the saving manifestation of the Savior in the body and the conclusion of the cross, it is clear that he is the Savior. 
being revealed in the body, destroying death, daily displaying the trophies against it in his disciples. For when one sees human beings who are weak by nature, leaping towards death, neither shrinking from its corruption nor fearing the descent to hell, but with an eager spirit challenging it, not flinching from torture, but rather for the sake of Christ, preferring instead for this present life zeal for death. Or if one were to watch men and women and young children rushing and leaping towards death on account of their devotion to Christ, who is so silly or who is so incredulous or is, who is so maimed in mind as to not understand and reason that it is Christ to whom human beings are bearing witness who provides and grants the victory over death to each rendering it fully weakened in each of those having his faith and wearing the sign of the cross. Would you pray with me? Lord, let it be the case that you embolden us with settled conviction that reflects what you have done, what you have called us to, and the hope the gospel provides the world. Embolden each of us with greater confidence, reflecting the degree of your jealousy for your glory and your desire to help us. We ask it in the name of our high priest Jesus and the eternal spirit that raised him. Amen.